So without any further ado, um, it is my great honor to introduce our speaker this afternoon. J.L. Richardson uh, first came across my radar years ago when I picked up her lovely children's book, The Stone Thrower, which I think many of you might have in your libraries. It's a book about her father, the former CFL quarterback, Chuck Ely. And it's a, it's a powerful story of determination and resilience in the face of overt racism. It's also a story about the power of education. Uh, that book was always sort of close to my heart and I'd go into libraries and I'd see it there. And then suddenly last year, JL's name dominated my social media feeds. Apparently she had written her first novel and it was absolutely explosive. So I rushed out to buy Gutter Child. Gutter Child is a book that plunges the reader into this imaginary world, which really highlights the stark inequities of race and gender and social class. It invites young people to start thinking about really big ideas, uh, such as inequity, inequality, privilege, positionality, and justice. Gutter Child is one of those YA books that really opens the door to hard conversations about equity with young people. And these truly are important conversations that we need to have. So it was not a surprise to me that Gutter Child blew up Twitter. In addition to being an accomplished writer, JL has uh, many other achievements under her belt. She's a writer, she's a broadcaster, she's a book columnist. She is a regular contributor to CBC's art magazine called Q. She has been the writer in residence for the Toronto District School Board. Uh, all those things are to her credit, uh, but most impressive though seems to me to be her advocacy and her social activism. She has significantly shaped the discourse around race, equity and diversity in Canadian literature and in, in literature in our schools. She is the co-founder um, and I believe the artistic director and executive director of the Festival of Literary Diversity, The Fold. If you have not looked up The Fold, and I'm sure many of you are doing it right now, uh, The Fold is a, a really groundbreaking festival. It's Canada's first festival that's only for diverse authors and storytellers. It provides very unique experiences for kids and for adults to, um, to engage in hearing and talking to and listening to equity-seeking voices. It's a, it's a platform to elevate and amplify underrepresented voices in literature. And it really challenges the narrative, it challenges the publishing industry to do better. It's an important place for writers to discuss their craft um, and to talk about the challenges of being in this industry. The Fold runs in the spring, so it will run in the spring of 2022, and I believe it will be a virtual conf uh, conference festival again this year. And I strongly encourage you to, to look it up and participate if you can. And JL was the, the mastermind behind it. I, I really think we're in for quite a treat today. I am so happy to present to you uh, JL R Richardson. Welcome. Oh, that's a, that's quite the intro. I feel, I feel very emotional to be quite honest. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for that, Rebecca. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't, um, you know, you hear your bio read a lot, but um, to hear someone put together the story of your life in their own words and what they feel, feel is most meaningful about what you've done. Um, well, everybody should have that experience. And frankly, Rebecca, you should write them all. <laughs> um, it was really, really, really lovely. Um, I'm so grateful to see so many of you in the squares. It's really funny as a comedic break from that very sappy uh, reaction. I will say, I think it was Nicole wrote a response as you were talking about Gutter Child. And she wrote, Nicole, uh, she wrote, Gutter Child sucked me in. And all I saw was Gutter Child sucked. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. This is a hard crowd, hard crowd. Um, so, so on the other side, uh, I got grounded that way, but I did see the whole thing, Nicole. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but that was the first thing I saw and I whoo, paused for a second. Um, I do want to say, um, a few things to get started because I will forget as I get to the end. Um, 
One is thank you for introducing Fold. I just want to do a little plug or my team will will never speak to me again. Um, we do have a Fold Kids Book Fest coming up in November. November 4th to the 7th is our live work uh, live festival. And by live, it is virtual. So uh, it will have a platform. You can log in. Uh, it's quite fun, actually, the platforms. If you went to Fold in the spring, you would have seen something uh, similar. But this one will be very uh, kid-centric and teacher-centric. Um, there are workshops for for teachers specifically, and there are also kids and work kids events and workshops for students. And you can watch them live. Some of them won't work for Pacific time, but they'll also be available on demand for a month. So even the ones that happen on the weekend, you can use in your classroom. Uh, we'll be having an educator guide. And since I have you all here and all the people with the money here at the same time, I will also say um, you can buy an individual past and use it in your classroom to show all your, your students. You can also bundle passes. So there's um, um, five passes for $50 instead of $14 passes. So we keep them um, pretty affordable to make it possible for everyday folks to join. Uh, but if there are financial difficulties, we also have patron passes available. So I just wanted to get that information out. Also wanted to mention, uh, we have our Fold Apparel out this year and our, our new slogan this year is Readers Are Leaders. Um, and uh, so you can get t-shirts from Fold as well and support the festival that way. That link is foldapparel.com. So administration aside, uh, really beautiful introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I'm actually in Vancouver on Vancouver time right now. So I feel very, you know, connected and close to you all. It's like uh, in my old theater days, you know, you sort of like really get into character. I came all the way to the coast to be as close to you all as possible. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this event. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you make it through a whole day of virtual <laughs> workshops and events and still be like, give me more. Um, and so I'm really excited. Um, I thought about this team, this theme, we rise and I loved it. I was working really hard to like fit so literally in it. And I hope this works, um, but I'm going with kind of a superhero theme for today's uh, lecture. Uh, my son's really into superheroes and we've been watching a lot of films lately. And so uh, I'm going to be tying in a little bit of that superhero theme uh, today. Um, Re <laughs> Rebecca did such a good introduction. I actually have like introduction pieces that I also share, uh, but I will give you a little bit of sort of where I am uh, family-wise, before I get you guys to do a little activity. Um, so my family is actually from um, the States. Both my parents are American. And this is something I kind of do um, as a sort of land acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging um, I am on uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit uh, First Nations territory usually. Um, and I also mention, you know, where I'm from. And so my parents are actually American. My ancestors are all American for as far back as I can trace. And um, that's been a really uh, important part, an important realization that I've come to and want to mention because it's also been very difficult to acknowledge that I can't trace my way back to my home and to the home of my ancestors. And so I really, really um, take the time to think about and to acknowledge the land that we're on, the land that I find myself on as well, just as a reminder of those names, those people, those places, um, where an attempt to wipe them out uh, entirely was uh, enacted and uh, thankfully unsuccessful. And so I think it's really important to remember the land that we're on and the people who are here uh, and the places that we all come from. Um, and that's kind of the beginning of uh, the conversation today, uh, where I wanted to start with this superhero conversation is where I find myself particularly fascinated on the superhero landscape, which is origin stories. I think it's so important to know your origin story. And that's sort of the first point I want to make in this conversation is to understand where you're from, where you've come from, where your story has brought you is sort of the key to the beginnings. I remember watching Saturday morning cartoons, especially X-Men. I watched that a lot. And whenever the, the story went back, not from the immediate action to sort of the background of where Storm came from or where Wolverine came from, I was always fascinated that these people who appeared so uh, phenomenal, so powerful, so big, so uh, otherworldly in a way were, were ordinary people aboard an ordinary 
places um, who had these incredibly normal stories of origin in a sense, some slightly abnormal, but <laughs> uh, you know, these stories that, that made them. And so I really want you to think about that. And the activity I want you to do first is very book related because I always have to bring back to the books. Um, and so I want you to think about the books that you read in high school. And maybe if you remember middle school, you can drop some of those in there as well. I'm going to do this activity as well. So I want you to grab a piece of paper, a pen. You can use the notes on your phone, whatever works for you. But I want you to start to jot down the books that you remember reading in high school or middle school. And I've thought about this, obviously, leading up to this, but I'm going to take the time to physically write them down for the first time so that I get a sense of how long it might be taking you. So there'll be a little bit of like an awkward silence where you might just hear my paper rustling and my pen moving, but we're all okay. And if you just joined in and you join into the silence, you'll figure it out. Uh, so write down middle school and high school books that you remember reading for school. Sorry. Yes, that's a very important. I want you to think about the ones that you read for school that were assigned to you. Sometimes I forget the names of them. Okay, you can keep writing if you're still thinking about them. Um, I want you to go through and look at the list and I want you to put a check mark next to the books where you felt there was a main character who looked like you. So if you felt there was a main character in the book that might've looked like you, uh, I want you to give a check mark. I want you to put a star next to the ones where you felt you could identify with a character. So that might be different than a character who looked like you. Uh, for example, uh, I read To Kill a Mockingbird and I felt in a lot of ways that I could identify with Scout in a way in terms of what she was like, but I don't think, well, I know she didn't look like I, I know I'm moving fast. You all are teachers like slow down. Yes, include Shakespeare too. <laughs> I know I can't slow down guys. Um, so you're going to check mark the ones where someone looked like you. You're gonna star the ones where you felt there was a character you could identify with. And then um, I want you to underline the ones where you felt there was a character from a marginalized community or a community that was unfamiliar to you where you learned something. And I'd also like you to sort of think about, um, sorry, a marginalized community and what they were doing in that book. So for example, uh, in To Kill a Mockingbird, there is a black character who is on trial, right? So you wanna think about what that marginalized person was doing. Um, I read Stone Angel when I was in high school as well. Uh, I think seniors are a marginalized community in a lot of ways. And um, she was the main character, right? So that's kind of like a, a slightly different look. So we're looking to sort of take an account or look at the books that were assigned to you as a young person and to think about some of the things that you were realizing, understanding, seeing or not seeing at the time. And that's really where I want to begin this origin story conversation. I want to talk a little bit about what my experience was like at this time, because I know, you know, we have teachers in all age ranges, elementary, middle school, and uh, high school, I imagine, and librarians as well. And I want to think about the places where we began, the origins that we're bringing into uh, our spaces, our places of work. 
And one of the things for me when I was in high school is that I loved reading. I absolutely loved reading. So when I look at this list of books that I read, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, I think I read The Outsiders in middle school. I read 1984, Brave New World, Stone Angel, Lord of the Flies, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Hamlet, Othello. I read these books and I loved them at the time. And some of them I still do. I loved them. I was that student where the teacher gave me the assignment and they're like, look at these themes and look for this and look for that. And I was like, yes, yes, I love it. I love it. Um, I read Stone Angel and I remember thinking I did not know uh, what older women were going through and rethinking how I thought about my own body and how I thought about perspectives on the world and just being transformed by books. But what's interesting now when I think back about that time and when I think back on those books that I was reading is that I was also going through a really difficult moment in terms of identity. I was also really struggling with who I saw in the mirror, with how I related to others, with where I was building community. Um, you know, my family, my mom and my dad are both only children. So I had no aunts or uncles. I had no cousins. And I just had my sister and my brother here in Canada. And most all of the families that we were close with were white. And many of my friends were white. And at the time, I did not think anything was missing, right? I was, uh, I had a great childhood. But I started to have these questions about what it meant to, to be Black in the world, whether I wanted to be Black in the world, whether I wanted to be called Black, whether I wanted to be called African-American, African-Canadian. And I'm reading these books. I'm reading Lord of the Flies. I'm reading Stone Angel. I'm reading Macbeth. I'm reading Romeo and Juliet. And none of these books are giving me any answers. None of them are providing me with deeper insight into who I am and what I should be thinking about and considering. And so two things were happening at that time. I was building what I considered to be a fractured worldview. So I was reading books that were either excluding places like African countries and South American countries and Caribbean nations, or I was reading books that were actively providing stereotypes about those places and spaces. And so my understanding of what the world was like was highly fractured. If you had asked me to describe, um, even I remember going to the projects for the first time with my dad where he was from, and I was like, this is not what I expected. This is not what I saw in the movies. Um, my perspective on even contemporary spaces um, in the United States, let alone African countries, uh, countries that at that time were, be call were being called third world or developing nations. My perspective on what those places looked like was so terrible that I can't even repeat what I thought because I'm so embarrassed by what I thought and what I perceived those places to look like. So I had a very fractured worldview. I had a fractured sense of my own story. Um, all the lessons I learned about Black history began at slavery and proceeded into emancipation and then talked about like, now we're all free. That was kind of the thesis and the lesson I was getting in history classes, in sort of the general Canadian lexicon. A, racism doesn't happen in Canada and B, racism in the States is generally over even though there's a few smatterings of problems. Um, and also your history begins with slavery. And all of those kinds of frameworks uh, were shaping a really problematic sense of myself and my place in the world about what it meant to be Black. And what happened, and you know, in any good superhero story, there's sort of a turning point where a person realizes what they have inside them or what they've been missing or what they might be capable of. And when I went to university, I... Uh, I started to feel what I would describe as an anger, <laughs> a rage, but I didn't even know where it was from. I just felt it. And sometimes it meant that when someone called me black or said I wasn't really black, I actually lashed out. And sometimes it meant that I just swallowed it and I just built this like very thick knot in my belly about who I was and how people were speaking to me and what that meant about my place in the world. 
And I remember I was a theater student. So I went to university to study theater. Um, I didn't know what was going to be the background to my theater studies, uh, but English ended up being um, sort of my minor, what I ended up doing. And I started to actively pursue books by African Canadian writers. And I took an African Canadian literature class. And that's where I met uh, Dion Brand for the first time and where I was introduced to a playwright named Janet Sears. And uh, for those of you who go looking up Janet Sears afterwards, her name starts with a D, a silent D, and then Janet, the normal, the typical, traditional, I don't know what word to use, but the spelling that we're probably more familiar with. So it's D-J-A-N-E-T. Um, and so I read a play by Janet Sears called Harlem Duet. And Harlem Duet is a prequel to Othello. And the premise of the story is that Billy and Othello are a couple, a Black couple in 1960s America. And they are, uh, they have broken up because uh, Othello has decided he's met a new woman. Her name is Mona, short for Desdemona. And he no longer wants to be in a relationship with Billy. And Billy's devastated. And the the, the play is very much about the history that they've shared as a couple, but also the history that they carry with them as Black Americans. And it's about uh, their relationship. Mona actually never appears on stage. She's a voice that comes in at one moment. The whole play is really about Billy and Othello and the way that his relationship with Mona fractures uh, them. And I read this play, and I hope uh, if there's kids in like vicinity, I'm going to quote a line from the play that is not necessarily kid friendly. Um, but the, there's one line that I remember to this day and, it, and she, Billy's yelling at Othello and she's really frustrated with like what he's willing to sacrifice and what he he's choosing in terms of Desdemona. And she says, you know, when white women were burning their bras, black women were holding their tits up. And I remember reading that line and thinking, like, like I had been, um, I want to say punched, but it felt more powerful than that. Like it didn't feel like I was being wounded. It felt like I was being, uh, equipped. Um, and in that moment, I really felt hurt. And I think many of us have probably experienced that in reading a book at some point, that moment where you feel heard, you feel seen, you feel validated. And it was so poignant to me that even now telling it, I can feel all the goosebumps on my arms, on my back, at the way that it felt to read that play. And I continued, uh, Janet Sears actually came to uh, the University of Guelph a few weeks later. And of course, I was like... <laughs> you know, sitting in the audience, ready to listen. I felt this, um, this need to talk to her. And I went to talk to her at the end of, uh, the, the conversation. I was the only black student in the room. So she and I were the only black people in the room of 200, 300 people. And I went to her afterwards and I just said, look, I am struggling. <laughs> basically that I'm, I am struggling. I don't know what to do. I'm an actor. I love theater, but every time I find plays, I can tell that they were not written with me in mind. I can tell that they were written for white women. And I don't know how to find more plays like yours, more things that will help me move forward in this industry. And she looked at me and she said, well, you'll have to write your own. <laughs> I was like, you, what? What? And I, I literally in my head was going like, um, that's not what I wanted to hear. I was like, I'm looking for the section in the library. I'm looking for the shelf, maybe the author, you know, and she was just like, that's why I wrote uh, her first play was a one woman show. And Harlem Duet uh, was her was one of her first plays. And she sort of said she had to create her own stories because there weren't any that existed for her and that I was going to have to do the same. And it was a quite a shattering moment for me because it was the first time I kind of realized that the inequity was so deep. It wasn't just about a lack of knowledge. It was about a lack of resources. It was about a lack of opportunity. And that was the beginning of me becoming a writer and really shaping me as a storyteller. And I want to just reinforce that statement I said at the beginning, this first section is about remembering to uh, know your origin story, to understand where you came from and where you began. And 
this moment of meeting Janet Sears and of uh, in the next the next year, I enrolled in a playwriting class. Uh, and this led to a moment, again, a really significant, profound moment where I understood not only the power of reading, but the power of writing. And in uh, I was in a playwriting class and I had created this character for this story and I knew I wanted to talk about race and I was sort of getting to the point where I could I could talk about race, I could create these characters who would have these conversations like what I had seen in Harlem Duet, but I was still kind of apprehensive about what was happening inside of me. And um, my teacher had us get like all in character and she came around um, to each of us and gave us a word. And then we were sort of supposed to launch into a monologue. And so I'm sitting there, I'm the only black student in the class. There's about 12 or 15, 12 of us in the class because it was a writing class. And she comes around to me and she taps me on the forehead and she gives me a word and the word is a well. And I remember distinctly, I said, a well, a hole that's deep, that's dark, that's evil, that's bad. And then you turn around and you call me evil and bad and dark. And I just started crying. And I started crying and I kept repeating these words. I'm evil, I'm bad, I'm dark, I'm black. I'm, you know, I, I kept saying these things and my classmates were crying. <laughs> I was as a mess. Um, but it was this really profound moment where I saw what happens when we allow our stories to come out of us, when we stop holding them inside because we're ashamed of what they, they how what kind what they might sound like. We're ashamed of what they might mean or reveal that it's actually a, a process that makes us unwell. And so for me, it was also not just about knowing my origin story, but understanding the impact that it could have if I shared it and understanding the impact that it could have if I let it out from inside of me. And the second thing I want to, uh, to sort of share in this, in this conversation is to know your superpower, to be able to identify what it is. And I know given this group, many of you share the same superpower. Um, and I know that many of you um, may not see it as a superpower. And some of you may feel like your superpower is not as good as the other superhero <laughs> superpowers around you. But knowing your superpower and understanding that it is a superpower is so key. If you've watched X-Men, if you've watched uh, Black Widow, if you've watched uh, the Black Panther, if you've watched any of those films, you'll see that in each of them, there's a moment where the character questions whether or not they should use their superpower or how they should use it. There's a point in which their superpower becomes a place where it is either underused and undervalued or wildly out of control. And I think it's one of the most exciting parts of growing and aging and developing in life is to be able to identify our superpowers and then train them and hone them and craft them and shape them into the best possible form they can be. I, I think there's nothing more exciting than the opportunity for improvement and the opportunity for growth. Nothing excites me more. Um, and um, I want to talk about that in a moment, but I first wanna make one connection before we jump back. And one of the things that became really, really important for me um, was understanding uh, maybe I'll share this a little bit later, but this, this, these moments that I was talking about in terms of um, reading Janet Sears and having that moment in theater class, what was so exciting about that is that I felt these things uh, that I think are just such a rich moment. When you read a great book that points to who you are or that teaches you something about who you are, uh, there's nothing like it. And when you write a book that comes from out inside of you, there is also nothing quite like it. And one of the things that that has taught me, and if you ever go on my Twitter and you see me ranting about book choices and curriculum, it's because I recognize what frustrated me the most in those moments was to have these incredible experiences and to know that I only was able to have them because I went to university, that I was only able to have them because my parents paid for a post-secondary education. And what I what I champion, what my what my superpower is and what I'm trying to hone is the idea that that experience is an experience every kid should have. 
it is a life-changing moment to see yourself in a book and to see yourself into in a story in a positive way that affirms who you are. It gives you power. It gives you strength. It gives you courage. And when we talk about teaching, about choosing books, about sharing books in a library space, we are talking about giving students superpowers, about giving them the opportunity to find their own superpowers. And it is so critical. I get so angry and I get so passionate because I think it is a particular kind of cruelty to withhold that opportunity from young people, to have them go all the way through high school, having never read a book that points to the wide variety of the world that validates the places that they're from, that validates who they are, that questions the world in really important ways. Um, so on the line, I'm going to come back to the curriculum and some of those solutions, but on the line of uh, sort of superpowers and knowing your superpower, I want to share a little bit about how I started Fold and about how kind of this superpower got honed in me and how I sort of uh, turned it into a career and a job. And then I want to give you some really practical tips and some really specific stories about what I learned as a parent and as a teacher when I taught at Humber College. Um, so my superpower was something I... Uh that was slow developing, I will say, first of all. Um, I sort of knew I was good at writing and that superpower uh, in university, as I shared, started to like percolate in me, but I didn't actually know how to use it. I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't know where to go to start to write a book. Um, and the other thing is I did have other superpowers. I uh, had worked at a university as a um, uh, a recruitment officer. I had done some event planning. And so I was sort of thinking, uh, you know, maybe I have this other superpower. Maybe this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. And one of the things that happened to me, I don't know if you remember in 2014, but there was the We Need Diverse Books movement that began in the United States. And to make a long story short, in terms of giving the background for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, there was a conference in New York in 2014, I think, and uh, the conference was almost entirely white. There was one BIPOC writer, everybody else was white. And a group of people sort of stood up and said, no, that's not okay. And on social media, people would make these posters and post using the hashtag, we need diverse books, why they thought diverse books were important. And so it was all across the States. It took place in Canada as well. And um, that was when I began thinking about Fold. I had read an article in a newspaper by Dalton Higgins, uh, and he had said, you know, we have the same problem in Canada. What they're fighting about, what they're talking about in the South is this problem here. We need more publishers. We need more editors. We need more uh, festival directors who are uh, folks of color. And I was like, oh, festival directors. I could do that. And it, literally it was that, that I was like, oh, that's the one I'll do. And so I started thinking about Fold. I started coming up with a name and a plan. And the mission for me was really about thinking about marginalized voices and giving them a platform and a place where they were given the opportunity to do two things, to speak about their identity and to speak about craft and to have the choice on which one they were speaking on. Oftentimes at festivals and conferences, if there were marginalized folks, if there were BIPOC, queer, trans, disabled, they were often being invited on panels to talk about being Black, BIPOC, queer, and disabled. They were very rarely on panels where they were talking about writing good characters or creating great plots. And there was sort of this marginalization within the system where diverse, diverse authors uh, are experts on diversity, but not experts in craft. And I wanted to create a space that changed that. And so I want to do uh, a little bit of an activity, another activity. And this time, I want you to think about the books that you have been reading over the last, now this is tricky because there are people in here who read like a hundred books a year. And so I know you're like, what? How am I supposed to think about the books I've read in the last year? That's so many. That's, I don't know how you do it. Bless your souls. Um, maybe take last month, maybe you just go with a month uh, or you can open your Goodreads or whatever you need to do. But I want you to take sort of a quick audit of the books you've read recently, probably let's say the 10 most recent books, five to 10 most recent books. And that way, those of you who've read a hundred know how to divide things up. I don't know what that's like. Um, so I want you to write down um, the last 10 books you've read. 
And you can just, if you remember the titles, if you remember the authors, I'm going to do the same thing. Luckily, most of them are on cue, so that was easy. Uh, so, uh, let's try to paradise. I have started about 30 books in the last month, if that helps anyone. Okay. How y'all doing? Good. Okay. Come on. Okay, this is one of my favorite activities to do um, because, and it's just the beginning. I think if you want to do a really deep dive, you're going to want to go, you know, deep into the Goodreads list and have a look and really start to ask yourself some questions. But one of the things that we do at Fold, one of the most important questions we ask, and we ask it, uh, I'm going to say about 30 to 40 times a year, um, is who's missing? And we ask it because it's required at every stage. And I guess one of my superpowers, because as you've seen, you can have more than one. So if you're a teacher, you can have more than one other than just teaching. Uh, one of my superpowers is that I love to, like I said, make improvements. And so the idea that someone's missing gives me the opportunity to improve, to change, to transform. And so the question of who's missing, I want you to look at your last 10 reads and think about who's missing. And I want you to think about the different categories and communities that you might be a part of. Um, so for example, if you are uh, perhaps of one generation, think about if there's anyone missing from a different generation, um, young, old, somewhere in between. Uh, you think about your representation of queer and trans voices. Are there anyone missing there? Thinking about BIPOC and breaking that up into categories, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and remembering that within each of those categories, there are actually categories within the categories. So I remember thinking once at Q, and I say this out loud because I think it's important to say sort of your embarrassing thoughts <laughs> that, that point to truth. But I was like, oh, is it okay for me to do like three Black writers in a row? Like, are people gonna? And it was like, no, one of the writers was like, from Britain, one was an African writer. Like there is such variety within the black community that I could read 12 black writers once every month for Q and still cover wildly different populations and intersections. So um, think about your representation of black voices. What kinds of black authors are you reading? Um, what are they writing? Uh, sometimes we can lean really heavy into nonfiction from writers from BIPOC communities because we have this sort of urgency to learn. So are you also reading fiction, right? There's so many different ways that you can think about the who's missing question. And the most important place to remember is that you are. The most important thing to do is to remember ask the question who's missing. Um, indigenous populations, indigenous to uh, what we would consider Canada, indigenous to other places in the world. Um, uh, also thinking about uh, different people of color, different faith-based communities. There's all different ways that you can look at that list of 10 and likely find a gap and likely find a hole. And so one of the things that is so important when we think about these superpowers and when we think about what we're doing is to question whether we're using our superpowers for good. If you have a superpower that's reading, that's teaching, that's educating, that's shaping, that's forming, what does it mean to have that superpower and how can you ensure that you're using it for good? When I was working on Gutter Child, one of the big questions I came, one of the big things I realized, um, for those of you who haven't read it, there are uh, Sosi people and mainlanders. And those are the two communities that have sort of been in great conflict. And the mainlanders have been our colonizers. They've taken over this land and sort of oppressed the Sosi people and some have moved and some are being forced into a particular system. And one of the challenges when I was writing mainlander characters is I really struggled to find, <laughs> well, I struggled to like them. And then I struggled to find voices that, um, that were honest and what I would consider evil, but also good. And what was interesting to me is I realized that many, most, 
Most evil people consider themselves to be good. Most people who are uh, doing things that are cruel don't actually believe that what they're doing is cruel. Uh, when we think about residential schools, for example, uh, the intentions, the people who led those really believed that they were doing a good thing and that they were taking care of these children. And it's horrifying, but it's also true. And it really made me realize um, the danger of not thinking carefully about what it means to do good. When we say using your superpowers for good, it's not just about showing up at school and being, you know, nice. It's about thinking about the ways that we're supporting and caring for the people who are within our care. Um, and that's your colleagues, as well as your students, as well as the, the children who come to the library, et cetera, et cetera. And so I really want to talk about, I want to share uh, a few stories in conclusion about what it means to do good when it comes to um, the literary space, the reading space, and young people in particular. Uh, I have a 12-year-old son, and uh, because I was a keen reader, I was certain that my son would be a keen and excellent reader. I was thrilled to be able to teach him to read. And at four years old, I pulled out the grammar textbooks and we sat down together and I was like, this is going to be good. Cat, hat, bat, mat, here we go. And uh, sure enough, we had another child who um, we brought who would come over to our house after school. And I'm like, great class time, two of you. It's amazing. And so we start these uh, grammar readers. And Isaac was the boy who, who visited. My son's name is Eden. And we did cat, hat, bat, mat. I would teach them the sound and then I would sit with each one and they would read. And then when they were done, they could go play with the toys. And Isaac came up and he was like, cat, hat, mat, bat. You know, he was good, right? Said the first one again. Eden comes up and he's like, and I thought, hey, you, you could cheat. You could have just listened to Isaac. It's going to be the same thing. And he was not. He was like, at, at, and he would, every single word was new to him and was a trouble, a trial and a struggle. He did not see the pattern in the words, no matter how hard I tried. And I was really concerned that he was not going to be a reader, was going to struggle in school, and then his life was going to fall apart. This is how, of course, a catastrophic mother develops her narrative. And I had to accept the reality that Eden had two parents and that the other parent was not a reader, does not like books, does not read, and that he had somehow inherited that gene instead of mine. Um, and so I, I thought, well, what had happened in, in my husband's um, childhood? And he struggled as a reader. He struggled. His teachers basically were like, you're behind, you're behind, you're behind. Catch up, catch up, catch up. And he never, never came to a point where he learned to love reading. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to be chill. I'm going to do something that's against my nature. I'm going to chill. And so I decided to give Eden whatever books he wanted to read. So for a long time, he read picture books well, below, well, well beyond when he was supposed to. And picture books that were probably below his age level. But he started to build a confidence with those books. And the confidence, I realized, became the key. He would, when he got so confident in a book that it was almost boring, he would start to look for books that were the next level. And he sort of gradually progressed in this, in his own reading, in his own pattern. We got him, um, um, what are they called? Guinness Book of World Records books. And we got him Sports Illustrated Kids. And we let him sort of read what he liked out of those things. Uh, and he eventually progressed into graphic novels. And he could read graphic novels. And I believe I'm not a teacher. I don't know. Some of you can probably explain what was going on. But I think it was a lot of work for him to read more so than for others. And so what he liked in the graphic novels is that there were few, fewer words on the page and there were pictures to help ease the effort of reading. And uh, recently he's moved into chapter books and he'll read over breakfast and he'll read before bed, but it's been a very slow, careful progression and a careful kind of like, 
why don't you read this or try this? You don't like this, we get rid of it. And I really want to encourage you all as you have the superpower to think about the ways in which you can cultivate spaces where reading and enjoying and loving reading is the single priority. We're cultivating a deep desire to consume stories is the priority and that it can come from graphic novels. It can come from spoken word. Uh, my nephew, who is also 12, is an audiobook. He has read all of Harry Potter books all by audiobook and does not like to read physical books. And his mom has been like, I don't think this is a good idea. And I'm like, hey, honestly, it does not matter. He knows how to read and he likes audiobooks. These are the keys. Um, and so to really think about the ways in which we cultivate a love for reading. I think uh, education has been a, a rather colonizing space where there's been sort of a real priority on these like learning outcomes and practical measurable skills in which we can provide grades and measurements. And there's almost been, in my opinion, a bit of an obsession there. I, I had two teenagers who came to live with me at various points, um, and both of them were a part of an English course in which their English assignments were more difficult than any university English assignment I had ever done. Uh, they had to compare the two books they had read over the semester and also integrate a comparison with Marxist theory. And they had to do this over five pages or 10, I can't remember, but I was like, you don't have enough room to do this. You don't have enough room to do this right. And it was a game of, of uh, Jenga, like a puzzle that we were constantly trying to weave together. And I knew while they were doing it, that none of it was fun that they were not learning to love reading, that they were not learning to think critically about the world. They were learning to follow a rubric and a map. Um, and I say this, and I have to share this last story because I don't want you to think that I am uh, good or perfect, which is not the case at all. I wanna tell you this story to, to, to sort of wrap things up and I wanna, I wanna take some questions from you uh, to, to really conclude. Um, but the, I used to be a teacher at Humber College. And when I started at Humber, I was really excited to teach. I had loved English. I had loved literature. Teachers loved me. I loved them. It was a great symbiotic relationship. I learned the hamburger paragraph like a boss and I used it like a sword and all the weapons that it carried with it. I got A's in abundance. Uh, it was a beautiful thing. And so when I got to college, I, I made rubrics that were impressive impressive rubrics where everything was fair and equitable. And uh, I taught students the hamburger paragraph and thesis and all these sorts of things. And uh, we had sort of a, um, a curriculum change. And they said, you know, we're going to get rid of the hamburger paragraph. We want you to use this new model. And I was like, you know, left the meeting like many of us do. I'm like, I am not doing that. <laughs> and I kept doing the hamburger paragraph. I got called into the office and they were like, you need to get on board. And I was like, fine, you know? And what they wanted us to teach was two things, two skills, summary and analysis. They wanted every kid on every right, like if they were reading an article or reading a book to focus on summary and analysis and just in blocks, like bare blocks, no structure, just summarize and then analysis. I was like, what? That's, that's so simple. Like, how am I supposed to measure this on a rubric if they've gotten these skills? And I realized uh, in doing it the first time, the students really struggled with the basics of summary and analysis, understanding the difference between putting things in your own words and giving your own opinion. Um, many of the students struggled to criticize the writer. I was like, what do you think about the writer's point? Do you think it's true? And they're like, well, they're the writer. They know. <laughs> like, that's not the point. Like, what do you think? And it was fascinating to me when I embraced this new change and this new system to see that at the core level, I was teaching them actual fundamental necessary skills, the ability to read and consume content and put it in your own words and the ability to offer opinions about it. And it became so much simpler, honestly, in the classroom to spend time on the book, on the stories and the conversations because the task was so basic in a way. 
And I was surprised at how much more I enjoyed the conversations in the classroom, at how much richer the conversations became, because we were focusing on these things that were so practical, that weren't designed for the keener students like me, but were designed for the everyday student, the average individual, the kid who maybe has not identified their superpower in reading and literature. And so I want to wrap up by reminding you of these three points that I want you to carry with you, which is know your origin story, know your superpower, and use your superpower for good. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> I think did I forgot to ask if there was question and answer period or if we're just uh, no we can uh, absolutely do a question and answer period so um, if you have a question for uh, jail uh, what I would like you to do is raise your hand and I'm going to spotlight you and put you in so that you can ask that question sure. so who wants to be the brave person that goes first it's like, this is not how keynotes go, right? All the teachers are like, this is this is not how things end. You're just supposed to say bye and disappear. But I, I feel like it's always important, especially in virtual. There's no way to have that like post conversation. So burning questions. Uh, I won't judge you if you don't know how to put it in the right order. Just say what's sort of on your mind. Um, oh. May I ask, please? May I please ask a question, please? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I I'll raise my hand. Yep, I'm going to try and uh, pin you. Okay, go ahead. Me? Yep. Okay. Um, you have talked a lot about superpower. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering um, uh, a situation in Texas, for example, the Republican government control the agenda and they basically want to omit a lot of historical facts in the curriculum and they have restricted a voting right. And, and a lot of the, the wealthy elites basically blocking uh, Joe Biden uh, progressive uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. so, um, so how can you combat uh, the voting rights suppression and uh, the suppression of the curriculum historical fact? Mm -hmm. What are your strategy for doing that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I think one of the challenges, and this is something I really wanted to explore in Gutter Child, right? I, uh, the book uh, is about a system that's designed for the failure of some and the success of others. And I think, you know, I could write a very long paper about how America was built for the success of some and the failure of many. And what you're seeing is that living itself out in ways that we probably knew but didn't really want to acknowledge, but are now seeing in a, in a very particular kind of way. And the challenge that I came across in writing Gutter Child is that I wanted to figure out if there was a way to tear those systems down or what historically has happened to tear down systems like that. And the truth is big change has always taken wild amounts of time and wild amounts of legal resources, as well as social justice, um, people who are committed to social justice on the ground. And so if you look at the civil rights movement in the States, there were people who were in the courts fighting for the rights for laws to change. And then there were people who were on the ground doing sit-ins, organizing, teaching kids, you know, uh, all these sorts of things. So as teachers, the question, or as people, I think the question really is how and where do I spend my energy? How and where do I make change? Do I get involved politically and, uh, you know, volunteer with my local XYZ? Uh, do I uh, do work on the ground? Do I attend protests? Do I um, uh, provide educational resources or really commit to teaching kids despite the fact that you're told not to teach it potentially? So I think you have to really sort of figure out and this is where that like knowing your superpower and using it for good. One of the, the mistakes I think people make is they get overwhelmed and they try and do too much. They try and use like just get get involved everywhere to show that they're doing the work. And at some point you have to say, like, where am I meant to be? Where am I meant and best suited? But I think in every one of our jobs, in everywhere we work, we can do something 
to move the needle forward, to push things forward. So it may be, you know, yeah, the government saying teachers can't teach critical race theory or that you need to teach Shakespeare for the umpteenth zillionth time. You know, maybe it's about the fact that uh, you teach a different book instead of Shakespeare, even though you're not supposed to. I didn't say that for the the administrators that are like, you're not allowed to do that. Um, But maybe, you know, in your libraries, the the books that are forward facing, you really think about the message that those forward facing books are saying. Um, Those are the kinds of things I think I I won't get into too many specifics because I think they'll apply to some and not others. But I think in every job, in every role, in every circumstance that you're a part of, there's a way to commit to change and to commit to small acts of change and resistance even when you're being sort of told not to. Uh, sorry, but how do you deal with the re- Republican government in Texas that decides to cut, cut funding, educate funding for poor African-American neighborhoods? Like, how do you deal with that? Like, well, I don't deal with it because I'm in Canada. So I, mm-hmm. I'm sorry if there are those of you who are Americans, I can't really speak to that. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that one of the lessons, uh, what I spoke to was just some of the things that I think we can all take away in our, in our workplaces. So thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Lisa, I'm going to uh, put you in next. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't really have a question, but I had a realization as you had us doing our reflection piece today. So as I was going through all of the books that I read uh, during elementary school, high school and, and middle school, I realized why I hated reading so much at that time. And like, I never, I I'm always looking for books that my students are going to connect with, but I never actually realized where that momentum had come from for me. And so thank you for shining the light bulb for me and, and connecting my passion for connecting the right books with the right kids and, and getting that all together. So thank you. Masi Cho. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Nicole. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, it, it gutter child did not suck. Um, I it it sucked me in. I know, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it, and it's amazing. And I've told everyone to read it since. So don't no. Anyways, and second of all, thank you. This was so inspiring and filled me up today. And just like this was an amazing way to finish the day. So I just want to say thank you. But Now I want your secrets Mm. because one of the things you said was about um, uh, like, uh, so what I wrote down was cultivate a space where reading, reading and enjoying books is the sole purpose. And I know that's not exactly what you said, but by the time I got to the end of writing, I forgot. Sounds good. (laughs) Um, And then, and, and the question you posed was like, what are the ways we can cultivate a love of reading? And Mm -hmm. I'm always struggling with trying to reach those those kids who have, cause I, I'm so my, I'm now at K to eight. Most yeah. of my history is at middle school. Yep. And so by the time they get to me in grade six, by the time they're in grade seven, they're already shut down. They're already, I don't read. Yeah. They just go, well, I don't read. So they won't even look at anything. They won't take a suggestion. They won't try an audiobook. So I want your secrets. I would say, I mean, I think there is not a child in the world that does not enjoy a Guinness Book of World Records. Like I feel like any kid, and the only challenge is if the the level of reading is too challenging, but there's also Guinness Book of World Records kids that are really even more simplified. And they're just full of like disgusting facts, like the largest collection of poop and like just anything like that. I just, I do not believe I I brought, I I bought my son a book when he was young and he was in that stage where I'm like, I'm not know what's, I didn't know what was happening with his reading. And it was called, does it fart? And like, oh my gosh, loved it. Right. Does a horse fart? Does a frog fart? Like this was fascinating to him. And so I think that, um, it's about like tapping into their most, uh, their, their most core desires, which is like funny words, like also a book. Like if I got my son a book that was called, uh, this is nuts, anything with nuts in it, he thinks is like the most hilarious thing. So again, I think it's about finding things that are, are likely to make them laugh, uh, are likely to get them consuming content and sharing it. That's what I love about the kind of Ripley's or the, the Guinness book of world records are like, miss, did you know? And they, they read it and they share it back to you uh, because they can't keep how fascinating those stories are. So those kinds of things, also books of jokes, um, 
books that are full, like joke books. My son thinks those are, are pretty phenomenal as well. Um, the sports stats ones, if they're sports kids, the sports stats are kind of fun too, because, um, they can just kind of pick the ones that interest them. And that's what my son loved about magazines. He would kind of pick, um, the numbers, the, the birth, like he would look at who has the same birthday as him and, you know, those kinds of things. So I would just say like, go to the deep, the deep in the dark. (laughs) Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, And also, I would also say we often forget too about nonfiction. Sometimes kids are more inclined to learn even about a country or to learn like actual facts about things that are real rather than imaginary places. Excellent. Uh, Christy. I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to say, um, I don't know if you know, but uh, as fabulous as uh, Joseph has been in organizing this conference, we've had a bit of a a difficult day. And I just want to thank you so much for bringing it home um, in such a a fabulous way. But also um, the takeaway for me uh, that I just have to share with everybody um, was your focus on you know, if, if they're loving the stories and especially with those um, uh, audio books, yeah. right? So I have uh, two sons of my own who are in their 20s now, and um, it wasn't that they didn't like stories. Obviously, they love stories, right? Obviously, they love learning facts, but it wasn't until they were able to just go onto YouTube, go onto Audible, listen to um, to books that not only did they find that love, but um, that they they started to engage with books that I I never would have even tried with them. So um, so again, just thank you for that reminder of uh, hooking them up with with what they love and um, and focusing there first. Thank you. Yeah, and I I think it's a great way to wrap up and to just say like we all love stories. There's not a person in the world that doesn't love stories. And we have put a lot of value in these written word page stories and in measuring how well someone can read and recite and consume a written word page story. And I think if you can really get your head around uh, pulling back and thinking about the larger form of stories, about oral storytelling traditions, which, which are at the root. If you go, I mean, my, my husband's family is West Indian. If you go to their house, whether they're readers or not, there are stories being told at every minute. Crazy, wild stories about the old days, about the day they went to the grocery store. They're long and they're elaborate. And we're all listening. And so if we think about stories, um, we can also expand to include, you know, plays and films and the writing and the way stories are presented and way some people consume stories differently. And if we can really uh, kind of, I will say this, we have these fold uh, kids events and what we do in the morning, we usually have a panel of authors. So we've had people like Sheree Dimeline and David A. Robertson and Ben Philippe, and they'll talk about their books. And inevitably when that event is done, there's a group of kids that walks out that are like, this is amazing. I've been like, I didn't know there were books like this. I love these people. And there's some that are like, you know, when they come back from lunch, we do a spoken word event. and. I know that when they leave, everybody has had a moment where they felt like, oh, I get it. I love, I like this. I don't know what it is. I don't know what, how it differs from what I'm doing in class or what I've read before, but like something about this, I like, and that's really what I think, you know, I I talked about be excited about the opportunity to figure it out, to figure it out in your classrooms, in your libraries, in your spaces. Be excited about the moments where you try something out and you create that moment for a child, a young person, even an adult. Um, It is really exciting. And I know from what I shared today, I hope you understand it is life changing. And so it's such a motivator for me at Fold to create the kind of content that gets like folks like you excited about reading books and about sharing books with your students. And I think it's sort of a ripple effect that you'll be able to do that same kind of thing within your classrooms um, and within your homes too. Uh, So I want to thank you all uh, for having me here. Thank you for enduring uh, in a long day. Joseph, hey, I know what it's like to put on a virtual event and to come across obstacles. Bless your soul and your heart for for, for sticking it through all the way to the end. and, And thank you for including me in the day. Thank you very much, JL.
Uh, this has been a fabulous presentation, and we're really grateful that you uh, took the time to uh, uh, join us today for this. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have some more prizes to announce. One that we hadn't um, announced ahead of time is we have 10 passes for the Fold Kids Book uh, Fest that we are giving away. Uh, the winners for that were Marilyn Lund, Charisse Bovier, Leah March, Stephanie Cave, Salima uh, Pavez, Fiona Smith, Tom Morley, Melody Ferrer, uh, and Tina Cousins. Sorry, uh, trying to look at two different screens at the moment. So um, we will be drawing your information because we have to register you from your easy reg uh, registrations. If you don't want us to do that, please contact me via email. My email is joseph.t.jeffrey at gmail.com or just send it to any of, reply to any of the many emails you've gotten from me over the last few weeks and I will um, deal with that. For the secret words from our vendors, your uh, the winners were Kerry Schwenker, Crystal Bergen, Brenda Carson, and Stephanie Rin. So fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you enjoy your weekend.